with the encouragement of Hilquit of, of Maya, London. Oh, this Maya. Oh, I know who that is. Maya of London. Oh, I never spotted that before when I'd read this article. So, Maya of London, what happened was, after the French Revolution, the garb of the English gentry changed. In fact, the whole of fashion changed because A, the silk manufacturing moved from France to England and the style, the sort of coquettish style of the French man was seen as feminine and it was restyled by someone on Maya. I'll, I'll try and dig that up for a fo uh, follow-up video. So Hilquit of Maya, London, socialist politician from New York, and eventually even Eugene Debs, the Jewish unions agreed then to concentrate for the time being simply on achieving stability. So what happened with this Maya is that they changed the form of the man's dress into a more, they call it masculine, but basically it's a more toned down, you know, like a bland version. So men were now, um, it came from the military. And what they done with the children was, they made sailor uniforms. So all of the children were wearing sailor uniforms. So all of these immigrants now could blend in. You know, they weren't following the fashion of the prior time, which was a different fashion, but I think Queen Victoria's son, Albert, he became the iconic wearer of the sailor's uniform, and that set the pace then for the sailor's uniform to be the number one garment for children to be wearing. So you can imagine a lot of the revolutionaries coming from France. If they're Jewish and they don't have the English style and Jews still being excluded from England, then they could blend in by wearing the same clothes. In the short run, however, it was res it was the resourcefulness of the Jewish labour force itself that played the decisive role in the unionising effort. The initial battleground was the women's garment industry. Here, for immigrant Jews, tactical direction emerged as early as 1890, when the 25-year-old Joseph Barandes, only two years in the United States, organised the cloak makers the single largest sub-community within the needle trades. Bur burning eyes and mustachios affecting the flamboyant demeanour of a bohemian aristocrat, Baron Dess won the hearts of his fellow workers with his soaring voice and gift for lacing radical agitation with Talmudic epigrams. It was Baron Dess in 1890 who organised the strike of 3,000 cloakmakers, almost miraculously sustaining the discipline and moral uh, morale of his fellow picketers through eight weeks of police brutality, strong arm goons, and economic deprivation and hunger. In the end, management conceded a, modest, a modest reduction of hours and workload. These are all fabricated events. Baron Dess and other labour leaders then spent the next few years struggling to consolidate their union. It was painful drudging work through the 1890s. Upon resolving a specific grievance, these early Jewish garment workers often allowed their union dues to lapse, painstakingly accumulating their savings. Many either sent for families in Europe or ventured into business on their own as subcontractors or petty retailers. As late as 1905, Abraham Bisno, Deputy Inspector of Factories for the State of Illinois, suggested in a report on Chicago men's clothing industry that most of the Jewish factory workers do not believe themselves to be working men for life, 
nor do they think that they will leave as a heritage to their children the lot of a wage worker. So they were planning something, and Abraham Bisno sussed it. It was a series of new developments that gave Jewish Union movement an unexpected lease on life. <laughs> so they had someone on the inside. One was the early 20th century wave of immigrating Bundists in their ideological zeal and commitment. These hard-edged socialists provided a vital infusion of staying power. Ironically, so did the growth of the clothing industry itself, particularly its New York-based women's garment branch. Over the first decade of the new century, Women's clothing became the third largest consumer goods industry in the United States. In 1900, the number of its factories totaled 1,224. In 1910, the figure reached 21,701. In the same period, the number of its workers rose from 31,000 to 84,000. With this growth and the introduction of newer, more efficient machinery, Older sweatshop haphazardly organised, economically redundant uh, sweatshops soon disappeared. The shift from sweatshop to factory in turn provided a more effective basis for unionisation. Workers no longer were isolated from each other as they had been earlier, dispersed among tenement flats. Crowded together now in factories, they were positioned to share their grievances and complaints to collaborate for group action. So they've set up camps. Still another factor accounting for the upsurge of labour activity was a consolidation of individual unions within the women's garments industry. Separate locals continued to function of cloak makers, presses, cutters, shirt waist makers and others. For years they would organise individually and strike individually in 1900, however, under persistent exhortation by Gompers and the AFL leadership, the various unions agreed to collaborate, at least with an umbrella organisation, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. So, the ILGWU was not about to turn conservative, endlessly infused with Bundist idealism, radical socialism. Marxism. It would for years. Oh, just a quick caveat. Socialism was for the worker, but obviously, Marxist socialism is for the Jews, and solely for the Jews. So whereas Robert Owen style socialism was about allowing the worker to build up equity within the company and have better working conditions, and other factory owners then so that you know the people were better off not only in their production capacity they would produce higher when they were kept happier like the old saying feed the troops the um, the Marxists they're setting the tone here like you've got to picture it as the destination for them is the world takeover that we're seeing at the moment so they've got benefits to arise from you know what it is that they're putting into and these factories were uh, locked so non-jews couldn't enter into the factories so as i say it's just basically military camps what they've been doing and the targeting the women's industry you know the women's garment industry uh, for so many reasons uh, it's you know it's good to target the fairer sex within the within the family unit to one be the authority of fashion you know the emperor wears new clothes type scenario where the Taylor told the Emperor, oh yeah, it looks very pretty, and the Emperor believed him. Even though that's the male aspect, it still very much works on the female, and these are targeting the females. <coughs> so the ILGWU was not about to turn conservative. Um, 
with the economy booming in the post-Spanish American War years, organized labor was making giant strides. In 1900 alone, some 450,000 new workers flocked to the IFL, responding to the confluence of these factors. The ILGWU by 1909 had grown to 63 locals, encompassing 16,000 members. Here at last was a Jewish proletariat structured to challenge the inferno of the clothing factory head-on. This article is reprinted from A History of the Jews in America by Howard Satcher. So, the actual article, the ILGWU strike of 1909, established a precedent for serious collective action in other branches of the garment economy. It was a devouring inferno. Employees laboured 65 hours a week. At the height of the season, they worked 75 hours and sometimes until dawn. Well, they've all got interests. Not infrequently, they were obliged to provide their 